Robert uh, S. Levine is professor of English and distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, College Park. He received his PhD at Stanford University and has been teaching at the University of Maryland College Park since 1983. He is the author of a long list of books. I'll just mention the ones involving Douglas. Uh, Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, and the Politics of Representative Identity, The Lives of Frederick Douglass, um, and, edu and, uh, and Frederick Douglass and Herman M Melville, Essays in Relation, Hemispheric American Studies. Uh, he is the general editor of the Norton Anthology of American Literature. Uh, he has received fellowships from the NEH and the Guggenheim uh, Foundation. In 2014, the American Literature Section of the Modern Language Association awarded him the Hubble Medal for Lifetime Achievement in American Literary uh, Studies. Um, and I'm going to find my notes on the actor Phil uh, Darius Wallace is a native of Flint, Michigan, where he was introduced to the world of performing. Since that time, he has attended Interlochen Arts Academy, where he studied theater. He studied for the profession of acting at SUNY Purchase in New York. His professional experience includes the Michigan Shakespeare Festival, the Flint Youth Theater, the uh, Attic Theater, and uh, Hatchaloo Theater. He has been a company member with Playhouse on the Square, Voices of the South, and is currently a company member with Playback uh, Memphis and Tennessee Shakespeare. Uh, his film and TV credits include Nothing But the Truth and ABC's Nashville. Uh, I present to you first uh, Professor Levine, and he will bring out Frederick Douglass in dramatic fashion. Thanks. Um, yeah, he'll come out in dramatic fashion in about 25 minutes, so please bear with me. So I'm honored to be here on, on the occasion of the celebration of the 200th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's birth. There are celebrations around the world this year, including in Washington, D.C., New York, Indianapolis, Baltimore, Paris, and Edinburgh. But this is where it's happening on February 14th. So my thanks to Curtis Morris for organizing this event. I'm also delighted to be sharing the stage with the great actor Phil Darius Wallace, who I've shared a stage with before. So speaking of sharing the stage with an actor, um, as I say, my guess is you'd probably prefer to hear him, so I'm going to give a shortest talk. I'm sure there are people here who know a lot about Douglas, but for those who don't, there are important things I'd like to share about his life and career as I lead you to the moment when he gave his great speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Frederick Douglass was born into slavery uh, February 1818 on the eastern shore of Maryland, around 60 miles from where I currently live. For the first 20 years of his life, he was a slave, moving back and forth between the plantations of the Eastern Shore and the urban setting of Baltimore. Thomas Ald, who owned Douglas, had a brother, Hugh Ald, in Baltimore, uh, and he would kind of lend them out uh, to his brother. Douglas much preferred Baltimore, which is around 15 miles from where I live. Uh, it has a wonderful memorial to Douglas at Fells Point, where Douglas used to work on ships by the docks. Douglas escaped from slavery in 1838, taking a train from Baltimore while disguised as a sailor. In New York City, he met up with his fiancee, Anna Murray, a free black woman from Baltimore who had helped with the escape and whom he had met at a black reading society in Baltimore. They married in New York City and then made their way to New Bedford, Massachusetts. As he had in Baltimore, Douglas worked at the shipyards there, and as had been the case in Baltimore, he encountered whites' anti-black racism. The free North still had a long ways to go, Douglas quickly realized, in terms of recognizing the basic humanity of black people. In certain respects, the North wasn't so superior to the South after all. 
Douglas also worked as a minister at New Bedford's AME Church, staying relatively quiet about his anti-slavery views, in part because he was still a fugitive slave and was afraid of being remanded back into slavery. But in 1841, he spoke out against slavery at an anti-slavery meeting in Nantucket attended by mostly white abolitionists. Douglas describes this key moment in his famous 1845 narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Quote, I felt strongly moved to speak. It was a severe cross, and I took it up reluctantly. The truth was, I felt myself a slave, and the idea of speaking to white people weighed me down. I spoke but for a few moments when I felt a degree of freedom and said what I desired with considerable ease, end quote. Douglass's act of speaking before a predominantly white audience was a turning point in his life, for it just so happened that the great white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison was in attendance. Garrison signed Douglass up on the spot as an anti-slavery speaker with a good salary. And Douglass, with the help of Garrison's Boston-based anti-slavery organization, moved with his wife and two children to a house in Lynn, Massachusetts, which Garrison rented out for him. Over the next several years, Douglas emerged as an electrifying anti-slavery speaker for Garrison's Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, regularly offering accounts of his experience as a slave while developing trenchant political critiques of the practice of slavery in the South and of racism in both North and South. Douglas later in life complained about Garrison, com complain, uh, claiming in his 1855 autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, that Garrison told him to stick to the facts of his experience of slavery while leaving the analysis to Garrison and other white abolitionists. But the fact of the matter is that Douglas's speeches were highly analytical about a wide range of matters and not just testimonials to the horrors of slavery in Maryland. From 1841 to 1845, Douglas was a loyal member of Garrison's organization, who now and then had to deal with skeptics, people who said that someone as eloquent as Douglas could never have been a slave. In order to address these skeptics, Douglas began working on his autobiography, and in 1845 published what remains his most famous work, narrative of the life of, of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, which is so highly canonical that it appears in virtually every anthology of American literature and is taught widely in high schools and universities. The narrative, which came with a preface by Garrison, was published by Garrison's Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and it implicitly conveyed Douglass's support for one of Garrison's core beliefs, the importance of nonviolence to the anti-slavery struggle. Thus, in a key scene in the narrative that many of you might remember, Douglas, when he rebels against the slave breaker Edward Covey, limits himself to self-defensive resistance. Instead of trying to kill the malicious Covey, who had been regularly flogging him, Douglas resorts to what turns out to be an extended wrestling match. As Douglas writes, quote, we were at it for nearly two hours. Covey at length let me go, puffing and blowing at a great rate, end quote. Douglas describes this moment of physical, but still essentially nonviolent resistance. His willingness to stand up to Covey as, quote, the turning point of my career as a slave, end quote. Overall, Douglas's 1845 slave narrative describes his rise from slavery to freedom as he shows how he tricked white boys in Baltimore to teach them how to read and write, how he resisted tyranny whenever he could, and eventually how he made his escape to the North. The book ends at the moment I've already referred to, when Douglas speaks at the anti-slavery meeting in Nantucket, Massachusetts, is discovered by Garrison and takes on the mission of anti-slavery work. Douglas's 1845 narrative, slave narrative, was a bestseller, selling approximately 10,000 copies in the United States, which was a lot at the time. 
It was widely reviewed in the anti-slavery and northern press. The feminist Margaret Fuller wrote one of the most enthusiastic reviews. The publication of the narrative actually made Douglas into such a celebrity that he had to flee to Great Britain or else risk being captured as a fugitive slave and forcibly returned to his master in Maryland. He was now a marked man, and so he decided to remain in Great Britain for two years, from late 1845 to the summer of 1847. Speaking and residing in England, Ireland, and Scotland, often being housed at the homes of prominent anti-slavery people in Britain, Douglas became an international celebrity as an anti-slavery speaker and as the author of the 1845 narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. While abroad, Douglass also began the process, metaphorically speaking, of liberating himself from garrison. He spent considerable time in Dublin, and while there, he worked with an Irish publisher to bring out two new editions of the narrative in which Douglass, not garrison, provided the preface. Douglass spoke with anti-slavery organizations that garrison did not approve of. He became a cosmopolitan of sorts who did not need to be aligned with or on the payroll of one particular anti-slavery organization. In October 1846, British supporters bought Douglas out of slavery and Garrison objected to that, arguing that such a purchase in effect legitimated the slave trade. Douglas responded that, pragmatically speaking, his free papers would allow him to return to the United States so that he could continue his anti-slavery work without having to worry about being remanded back into slavery. In 1847, so we're five years away from the speech, Douglas returned to the United States as a free man, but instead of going back to Lynn, Massachusetts and continuing his work with Garrison, he decided to go to Rochester, New York, then a hotbed of abolitionist and other reformist activity. His British supporters had given him money so he could purchase a printing press and start up his own anti-slavery newspaper, which he did soon after his return. One of the reasons he went to Rochester is that he didn't want to be in direct competition with Garrison's anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, which was published in Boston. Though the Liberator remained probably the most widely read anti-slavery newspaper, Garrison was furious about Douglas's decision to publish his own anti-slavery newspaper, which he saw as an act of betrayal. Douglas had a very different perspective. He thought he had the right to make his own decisions. He was no slave to Garrison, and that it was crucial for African Americans to have their own newspapers. Uh, in the inaugural November 1847 issue of his, new, of his new newspaper, which Douglas called the North Star, Douglas underscored why he believed that it was important that this was a black newspaper with a black editor. As he wrote in an editorial in that issue, quote, common sense affirms and only folly denies that the man who has suffered the wrong is the man to demand redress that the man struck is the man to cry out, and that he who has endured the cruel pangs of slavery is the man to advocate liberty." End quote. Though the North Star, which he renamed Frederick Douglass', uh, renamed du Frederick Douglass paper in 1851, never topped the circulation numbers of the Liberator, it did quite well, and it became one of the most vital forums for radical anti-slavery views during the late 1840s in the 1850s. Douglas would eventually publish his famous 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, in that newspaper. And Rochester, New York, would remain Douglas's home base for many years until he relocated to Washington, D.C. in 1870. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's return to Douglas and Garrison around 1850. From the time of Douglas's return to the United States from Great Britain, Douglas and Garrison remained in an uneasy relationship. In 1850, Douglas publicly broke with Garrison. This is significant for the 1852 speech that is the focus of the program today. Garrison, as I've said, argued for nonviolence, or what he called moral suasion. 
In some ways, he was the Gandhi of anti-slavery. Garrison also believed that though the Constitution has virtually nothing to say about slavery, it was a pro-slavery document because in its apportionment of congressional representation, slaves counted as three-fifths of a person. Thus, southern states with large slave populations got more representation in Congress, which meant that this particular three-fifths rule inscribed in the Constitution helped to bolster the southern slave power. The slaves were three-fifths of a person, but they could not vote, so the larger the number of black slaves in a slave state, the more white representatives the slave state would have in Congress. From Garrison's point of view, precisely because of this constitutional rule, the political system was so corrupt that whites shouldn't bother to participate in it. He thus urged abolitionists not to vote in federal elections. Douglas came to a different conclusion about the Constitution and his break from Garrison's beliefs in nonviolence and the pro-slavery nature, uh, I'm sorry. Douglas came to a different conclusion about the Constitution and his break from Garrison's beliefs in nonviolence and the pro-slavery nature of the Constitution would have an influence on his 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. In 1850, Douglas, Douglas publicly affirmed that he was no longer a Garrisonian. Instead, he had adopted a more radical politics of anti-slavery. In major speeches of the period, he argued that slavery was an act of violence against black people that, on certain occasions, should be met by violence. Among the positive examples of violence that existed in American history, he declared, was the American Revolution, the time when the British colonists used violence to fight back against what they regarded both metaphorically and actually as a slave power. And at the time, Great Britain had a slave empire in the West Indies. Douglas also argued that for pragmatic reasons, it was of crucial importance for abolitionists to become involved in the political system, which is to say that he came to believe that anti-slavery people should work for those political candidates who were opposed to slavery. Accordingly, in 1850, he also declared his new belief, contra Garrison, that the Constitution was in spirit an anti-slavery document. He thus closed his eyes to the three-fifths rule and instead concentrated on those many aspects of the Constitution that seemed to be about the promotion of freedom, individual and otherwise. In short, in 1850, Douglas emerged as a radical abolitionist aligned with people like the New Yorker Garrett Smith instead of the Boston-based Garrison. Garrett Smith, as some of you probably know, donated thousands of acres of his upstate New York property to northern free blacks. And in 1859, he was one of the so-called Secret Six who channeled funds to John Brown for his attack on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And maybe I could just quickly say that Douglas supported John Brown up to the time that he invaded Harper's Ferry. Um, and he basically said that it was a suicide mission. Um, after Brown was executed, Douglas continued to offer great support for Brown. Uh, let's stick with 1850 for now. And, and as I say, we're just two years, and I can tell you, 10 minutes from Douglas's entrance to give his uh, 1852 July 5th speech. So precipitating Douglas's break with Garrison and his new more militant stance on anti-slavery was Congress's passage of the Compromise of 1850, which included a strengthened Fugitive Slave Act. Following the passage of this legislation in Congress, all citizens of the northern free states where slavery didn't exist were now legally obliged to return fugitive slaves to their masters. And the free states were obliged to use their courts to support the return of fugitive slaves. Henry David Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau succinctly said that Massachusetts under the Fugitive Slave Act had become something very much like hell. And I'm quoting directly from Thoreau's 1854 speech called Slavery in Massachusetts. Equally infuriated by this bill, 
Douglas argued that the Compromise of 1850 nationalized slavery and gave a new urgency to the need for political activism. No longer, Douglas declared, could a free state claim to be a free state. All Americans were now implicated in slavery, and to anticipate the 1852 speech, he argued that it would be hypocritical to suggest otherwise. Work needed to be done at the political level to create the possibility of the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Act. But Douglas argued for more than just political activism. Since the late 1840s, Douglas had been asserting that slavery was an act of violence that made violent resistance worth considering. His view of the importance of physical resistance was only underscored by the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. During the 1850s, Douglas participated in a number of mass actions in Boston and elsewhere in which anti-slavery people tried forcibly to, pr to protect escaped slaves from fugitive slave catchers. And he argued that the use of a resistant violence made sense under these particular circumstances. As he remarked in 1851 in a speech titled Resistance to Bloodhoundism, quote, I am a peace man, but if anyone should attempt to take me into slavery, I should strike him down, not with malignity, but as complacently as I would a bloodhound and think I was doing God service, end quote. Not only would he be doing God service, but he would be acting in the heroic spirit of the American revolutionaries. Again and again, during this time, Douglas, in his writings and speeches, applauded the revolutionary fathers and mothers for their willingness to use a forceful violence to bring about their independence. Douglas, no doubt, genuinely admired the revolutionary generation, but of course, his celebration of American revolutionaries was meant to pose a challenge to white audiences. Uh, what, what are we to make of the fact, he seemed to be saying to white audiences, to white audiences that you're opposed to anti-slavery violence on the one hand, but celebrate the revolutionary violence of the patriots of 1776 on the other. And what happens if we think of the American Revolution not simply as a moment in the past, but as ongoing, unfinished? For the revolution intended to bring about freedom, Douglas would remind his auditors, instead produced a slave nation with one of the greatest ironies being that England itself, the very country that Americans were celebrating their independence from, had abolished slavery during the 1830s. All of which takes us to 1852, the year that Douglas gave with many regard as the greatest anti-slavery speech ever to be delivered in this country. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Douglas was invited to give this July 4th speech by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, and he gave it on July 5th at the Corinthian Hall in Rochester. His letters suggest that he worked hard on the speech. Douglas was already well known as a great orator, one of the greatest of his age, and it's worth remembering that during the 19th century, he was much better known as a lecturer than as an autobiographer. Precisely because of his fame as an orator, somewhere between 500 to 600 people, both white and black, paid 12 cents each to hear the speech. And oratory was public entertainment during the pre-Civil War years, and people were willing to pay good money, and 12 cents at the time was very good money to hear great speakers. Very importantly, Douglas insisted on giving the speech on July 5th and not July 4th. He felt that until all African Americans were free, he simply could not celebrate July 4th on the 4th. In this regard, he was following the tradition established by the New York Black Minister Nathaniel Paul, who gave the first 4th of July speech that I know of in the African American tradition on July 5th, 1826. That speech celebrated the end of slavery in New York State. But as long as slavery remained the law of the land, Paul could not give a celebratory speech on July 4th itself. We're about to hear excerpts from Douglas's July 5th speech, but I want to say just a few words about how Douglas, uh, how Douglas shaped the speech and developed his arguments and critique. 
He begins right from the start by developing an analogy between anti-slavery people of the American 1850s and American revolutionaries of the early 1770s like Patrick Henry and George Washington, making the very important point that there was a time when American revolutionaries weren't honored, but instead were regarded as dangerous radicals. The great revolutionaries we celebrate on the 4th, he says, quote, were accounted in their day as plotters of mischief, agitators, and rebels, dangerous men, end quote. Douglas then addresses the issue of violence, reminding his audience that the revolutionaries were, in Douglas's words, quote, peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission and bondage, end quote. The large thrust of his opening, then, is to celebrate anti-slavery people, even those willing to use violence, as in the tradition of the American revolutionaries. Douglas then turns to the present occasion and talks about how difficult it is for free blacks of the North to participate in Fourth of July celebrations while their brethren remain in bondage. The Fourth of July, he says to the whites of the audience, quote, is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I just mourn, end quote. He then builds to a famous passage on the hypocrisy of Fourth of July celebrations, which I'm not going to quote, because when Douglas shows up at the Carter Woodson Lyceum, I think we're going to hear parts of that passage firsthand. What to the Slave is the Fourth of July is a long speech during which Douglas attacks the Compromise of 1850's Fugitive Slave Act. By that act, he states, Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia. The, sl the fugitive slave law makes mercy to runaway slaves a crime, end quote. Then he attacks American churches for not speaking out against slavery and this new law. And it should be underscored that Douglass's willingness to attack U.S. churches for their willed blindness to slavery is one of the truly brave aspects of his anti-slavery work during the pre-Civil War years. I should also note the persistence of optimism in Douglass's anti-slavery work. He thus concludes the 5th of July speech with a broad, optimistic assertion. Quote, the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I begin with hope, end quote. And just as an aside, Douglas also said he, not, he never felt so hopeful about the end of slavery when the Supreme Court made its Dred Scott ruling. So this is an optimistic person despite his anger. According to newspapers of the time, the response to Douglas's Fourth of July speech was overwhelmingly positive. One newspaper wrote that Douglas was greeted by, quote, a universal burst of applause. After the speech, one of the organizers called for a vote of thanks for Douglas. The vote was carried unanimously. A request was then made that the address be published as a pamphlet, and 700 copies of the pamphlet were subscribed to on the spot. The pamphlet version appeared within two months of the gathering and just added to Douglass's reputation as one of the most powerful and eloquent anti-slavery writers and speakers on the contemporary scene. But I've moved ahead of myself chronologically. Let's return to the moment when Douglass gave the speech. There was a buzz in Rochester's Corinthian Hall as the anti-slavery festivities began. There were anti-slavery songs a few other speeches, and then it was time for the main attraction to take the stage. Just prior to taking the stage, and in perfect harmony with Douglas's large intention of highlighting the idea that the American Revolution remained an unfinished revolution, the Reverend Robert R. Raymond of Syracuse, New York, a well-known anti-slavery cleric, came to the podium and read to the audience the complete text of the Declaration of Independence, the nation's sacred founding document of human equality. Then, Frederick Douglass walked to the stage. Let 
friends, and fellow citizens. He who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not ever remember to have appeared before anyone more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my abilities than I do this day. The fact of the matter is, fellow citizens, that the distance between the platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. With a little experience and less learning, I've managed to place my thoughts Hastily and imperfectly together. And trusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I shall proceed to lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the anniversary of your national independence and your political freedom. It is to you what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God, it carries your minds back to that day and to the act of your great deliverance. May the patriots not hope that high lessons of wisdom and of justice and of truth will yet guide her in her destiny. Were America older, the patriot's heart might be sadder. The reformer's brow heavier. America's future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of her prophets go out in sorrow. But there is consolation in the thought that America is young. <laughs> Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask. Why am I called upon here to speak to you today? <clears throat> what if I or anyone I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? Am I to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, for both your sakes and ours, an affirmative answer would truthfully be returned to the question, then would my labor be light and my work easy and delightful. For who would not lend his voice to the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from its limbs? But such is not the state of the case. I say with a sad sense of disparity between us, I am not included within the pale of your glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us, the rich inheritance of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness bequeathed by your forefathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought life and health to you brought stripes and death. To me, this 4th of July is yours, not ours. You may rejoice, we must mourn. And to drag a man in feathers into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems is inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you intend to mock me, fellow citizens, by calling me here to speak to you today by the rivers of Babylon? Yay, we sat down. Yay, we wept when we remembered Zion. 
we hung our hearts on the willows in the midst thereof. For they who laid us captive required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing to us one of the Lord's songs. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Oh, Jerusalem, if I do not remember thee, may my right hand forget her cunning, and if I forget thee, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, beyond your tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wailing of millions whose chains grievous yesterday is today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not remember the bleeding children of sorrow, May my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the root of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over her wrongs and chime in with the popular theme is treason. Most scandalous and shocking would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long ways from home. A long ways from home. When I was a child, I did not understand the deep meanings of those songs. I myself was within the circle, so that I neither saw nor heard what those without might see and hear. They told a tale of woe that was altogether beyond my feeble comprehension. They were tones, loud and long and deep. They breathe the prayer and complaint of souls boiling over with the bitterest anguish to those songs. I give credit to my first understanding of the dehumanizing character of slavery. I cannot get rid of those songs. They follow me even to this day to deepen my hatred of slavery and quicken my sympathy for my brethren in bonds. If anyone wishes to understand the dehumanizing character of slavery, let him go down to Colonel Lloyd's plantation at high noon and place himself in the deep pine woods, and there, in silence, let him analyze the sounds that shall fill the chamber of his soul. If he is not thus impressed, it will only be because there is no flesh in his obdurate heart. Friends, the simple story goes that 70 years ago, your fathers were British subjects. Your fathers deemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. The home government did impose upon its colonial children such burdens and restraints as it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not given in to the idea of that day of the infallibility of government, began to differ with those policies. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. It was just then that total separation of the colonies from the crown was born, resolved, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that the situation between the colonies and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Friends. Your fathers made good that resolution. They staked their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor, all in the cause of liberty. They seized upon eternal principles and set a glorious example in their defense. Mark them, their solid manhood stands out all the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Shall we look at slavery? And also take a look at this day with this popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. What to the American slave is the 4th of July? 
I answer. It is a day that reveals to him more than any other day of the year the gross conduct and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. You know what is a wine, a swine drover? I'll show you a man drover. They inhabit all of our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock, armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children. These wretched souls are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves along and the savage wretch who drives them. See the old man with locks thin and gray. See, too, the young girl with her babe, her shoulders bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling over the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, the young girl at 13 weeping as she thinks about her mother from whom she has been torn. Follow the sad procession to New Orleans attend an auction there. See men examined like horses. See the frames of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave owners. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? But this is but a glimpse of the American slave system as it exists in the ruling part of the United States. But I fancy someone in my audience will say, it is just here in this moment when you and your fellow abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression upon the public mind. If you would argue more and denounce less, if you would persuade more and rebuke less, your cause might be much more likely to succeed. But I say, where all is plain, there's nothing to be argued. What in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Would you have me argue that the slave is a man? The point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slave masters have it in the enactments of the laws of their government. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if permitted by a black man, will subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of those same crimes, if committed by a white man, will subject him to like punishment. What is that? Well, the idea that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being. Southern statute books are filled with enactments forbidden under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read and to write. When you can point to any such laws as it relates to the beast of the field, then I will argue the manhood of the slave. Americans, you celebrate fugitives from abroad. You honor them with banquets. You toast them. You salute them. You protect them, but with the own fugitives here in your land, you advertise, hunt, shoot, arrest, and kill. You mourn fallen hungry and make the subject of her wrongs, the subject of your poets, your philosophers, and your orators. But of the 10,000 wrongs committed against the slave, you enforce the strictest silence and would deem him an enemy of the country that would make the subject public discourse. You say that all men everywhere are of one blood and should love one another. And yet, you notoriously hate those whose skin is not colored like your own. You proclaim to the world, and to the world proclaim, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Yet, you hold in bondage a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. In the American slave system, there's no marrying to establish family. There's no education to establish skill and learning. And the light of the gospel shut out from the dark mind of the bondman in him forbidden by law to learn to read. If a mother shall teach her daughter to read, the state of Virginia proclaims she shall be hanged by the neck. In the state of Texas, the father shall teach his sons the knowledge of letters. He shall be killed by the discretion of the court. Three million people shut out from the light of knowledge. Three million people shut in to the darkness of ignorance. Three million people that are bound by the chains of evil that can only result from such a state of things. But I am bound by the prayers and the tears and the supplications of three million of my countrymen and will bargain with no man connected to the American slave system whatsoever. I shall expose slavery. To expose it is to kill it. I am to slavery. What the light of the sun is to the root of the tree. When the roots are exposed, it must die under it. The only thing the slave master wants from me is silence. The only thing he wants is darkness on the subject. But what I want is for the American slave system to be surrounded by anti-slavery walls of fire so the slave master can read his own condemnation and his system come tumbling down in flaming letters of light. Friends, the existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism a sham. Your Christianity, a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. Thank you.